Marie Arana is the inaugural literary director of the Library of Congress and former longtime editor-in-chief of the Washington Post's literary section, Book World. Her memoir, American Chica, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Other work includes the novel Cellophane, a biography of the Latin American liberator Simone Bolivar, and the nonfiction book Silver, Sword, and Stone. A raft of awards from her long career in letters includes a 2020 award for her lifetime work in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the 2021 Library of Congress Award for Superior Service. This evening, she brings her new book, Latino Land. She'll be joined in conversation with Elizabeth Perez Luna, contributor to the Philadelphia Inquirer and former executive producer of audio content at WHYY. Please welcome our guests to the Free Library. Marie, I'm sorry I made a porcupine out of your book with all these notes, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so uh, Marie, not Maria or not Mary, uh, it's uh, Marie Harana is was born in, in Lima. I've, I don't. I'm not sure that I, I'm repeating what are into what, but I might re repeat it. It's worth repeating. And she was born in 1949. She's a prolific writer, editor, essayist, linguist, um, all sorts of contemporary literature uh, analyst. Uh, she's a, a former editor-in-chief for the Washington Post Book World, and she's still a regular columnist uh, for the newspaper. Actually, as a matter of fact, we're going to talk about a, an article she wrote uh, last week uh, on politics and elections. She has the lucky... Of commuting, lucky of commuting in between Washington D.C. and Lima. Can you imagine <laughs> what a life? <laughs> and uh, inaugural literal, uh, literary director of the Library of Congress. And I finally ask her, what does that mean? And it means that she brought contemporary literature into the Library of Congress. So she was. Uh, instrumental in, in, in bringing a new, new voices to the library. Uh, she has a, she speaks, she's a linguist too. Mm -hmm. She speaks Mandarin, having studied at the uh, Mandarin language uh, uh, at Yale University in China, and Russian, because she was interested in languages, so why not do two easy languages, you know? <laughs> and it would take me too long, too much of your time, to go through all the the things that you have Thank done. Thank you, Elizabeth. And Thank you. Uh, and she has a great. Uh, it's mariarana.net uh, dot net, and and Wikipedia has all the information you would want about the details of her life and her work. Not everything. No, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So you would need another big book to just just the things you've done. Um, she's, uh, uh, she has four children, two uh, adopted children and two of her own children, two of her husband's children. Uh, and um, so, Marie, in, in your work, you've navigated, I've followed your work for a while, the writer's work, both as an essayist, a memories, memoirist with your American Chica, mm -hmm. which is a finalist, was a finalist at the National Book Award about growing up bilingual novelist with cellophane and limonites, and historian with the biography of Simon Bolivar, among other things. They're all about Latino and Latin American themes, of course, and they're all different facets of your Latino identity, and it seems that it all comes together in your latest book. But I don't think you woke up one morning and said, basta, I need to write about a portrait of America's largest and least understood minority. It will be 550 pages, and I will name it Latino Land. It, that's not how it happened. So <laughs> let me know how Latino Land was born out of all this wealth of work that you're doing. It was a long road. It really was a long road. And it was um, a sort of a, a, a wandering road. I knew that I didn't want to write the same book twice, and I didn't want to write the same 
genre even twice, um, starting with a memoir. What, what I wanted to do was describe uh, Latin Americans and Latinos for people who weren't Latin Americans or Latinos. And it ended up being that um, there was a lot of interest from Latin Americans and from Latinos for this uh, subject. Um, and so I started going from one thing to another. I, I began with my own story of American Chica, which was about um, my life between countries and between, shall we say, identities and um, living on a bridge and uh, being the translator. My mother was American, my father Peruvian, being the translator for both, you know, and sort of negotiating that bridge all my life and not really feeling one thing or the other uh, at any time. So that was how I began. And, and then I wanted to write a, uh, a novel, of sort of an epic novel about a family just in general. And I drew from my family to write cellophane, which is set in the jungle of Peru in the rainforest, um, the Amazon. And, uh, and it was absolute joy to write because it was, I could pull from all my family the, the, the amazing stories that I heard as a child and the people that I met um, who were characters, and incredible characters, and I could feed them into this sort of satire about family life in, um, in Peru. And then Lima Nights, and I wanted to write a novel, but that was urban and sharp and a love story, and, and um, sort of arch. And I did that, it was very slender, I wrote it in four months, it was you know, uh, quite a different book from the epic novel of um, cellophane. And then uh, I challenged myself to, I, I had been an editor all my life, I had been an editor at Harcourt Brace Ivanovich, and I had been an editor at Simon Schuster. So writing was not new to me. Editing was not new to me. So I don't want you to think that I had never done a biography before, because I had edited many bi biographies before as a professional. So I decided to write a biography, and I wanted to find somebody whose uh, life uh, spanned the most geography of anyone I could think of and whose family spanned most years. And of course, for me, that became Simon Bolivar. I was always, um, I, I had had uh, two ancestors who fought against one another in the Battle of Ayacucho, which won uh, Peru's independence and also ended for good the, um, the uh, colonial world of Spain in Latin America. So uh, I was interested in Bolivar from the start. I also wondered why Peruvians were so hated Bolivar. You know, my, my father thought he was um, uh, um, a minor character, even though he was a huge character. But the, the, the tendency for Peruvians to put him down was, um, was really striking to me. So here was a man who whose life spanned, whose family life spanned 300 years in the New World, and who, uh, who liberated six republics right. uh, all the way, and who had traveled all the way from the Caribbean uh, all the way down to, to Bolivia. And to, he, he to went it. a lot to Haiti to learn a lot about the Absolutely. independence movement. The yeah. only support he got was from Haiti. The United States didn't want to support him right. because the United States was, uh, at that point, operating on a slave economy. And Bolivar's instinct was immediately to, to free the slaves. Um, and promised, in fact, uh, Petion, who was the pre president Petion of Haiti, that he would free all the slaves. Right. So uh, the United States never helped him, but Haiti did. Um, so from there, I thought, well, where do I go now? I've done a biography, I've done a memoir, I've done a, uh, fiction. Um, and then I decided to really, uh, I was talking with my aunt, who was also my madrina, my godmother. And I said, you know, the, the writing about Bolivar really convinced me that the heart of the difference between Latin Americans and North Americans was the revolutions that they, they lived through. Uh, and she said, well, if you really believe that, you know, um, explain it more. And I said, no, there's a very huge difference between, between um, the Americas. And I think that is where the difference 
is most extreme. And so I took up her challenge. She said, write about that. And to write about that, I, I had to write about all the problems that were faced in the, in the wars of independence and before the whole colonial life and all the problems that still persist in Latin America. So that's what I wrote. And in the process of writing all of these books, they all took place in Latin America. Um, it became obvious to me that here we were in my lifetime, in my lifetime, um, I had come when there were two million Latinos counted, Hispanics, Latinx, whatever you want to call us, uh, counted in this country, two million. And now there are 64 million mm -hmm. in my lifetime. So I thought, my God, how can I ignore this population? It's the size, it's larger than any Spanish-speaking country in the world except Mexico. Imagine that. It's bigger than Venezuela, bigger than Colombia, this population of Latinos. That's so that's, that's how I decided to do this book. Yet I think one of the points you make in the book, and that, that's why you use this intriguing uh, introduction, I mean, uh, title, is that it is not understood or known as well as it should be. There's, Latinos are still seen as recent immigrants and all immigrants, and you make a point in your book that Latinos are not all immigrants. That how many are, have, are born here? You said there was an enormous sixty-four million. Yeah, sixty-four million. I mean, it's a, it's astonishing amount right. of, of so of it's population. not an, it's just a story of immigration. Right. But one of the things that's intriguing is that there's there are few aspects of American U.S. American life that does not have some sort of a Latin tinge. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I made a, a quick list, but it, it, you know, language, food, music, culture, uh, all sorts of other things. Science. Yeah. Science. Except that not, not politics. And... Or, well, uh, the, the oh, it doesn't seem that politics is an important aspect of Latino life. Not American politics, no. Yes. No. No, that, that is not. Um, you know, the, the, there is such, a, what you say is so important um, that we are seen perpetually as arriving. Whereas, whereas you know, we have been here, uh, 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 Hispanics, Latinos fought in the American Revolution. There was a whole river of, of uh, uh, Latin people who came up from the Caribbean and from the Central America and from Mexico to fight in the revolution um, led by the Spanish forces that were sitting down, of course, in, in uh, New Orleans and Florida. So from the very beginning, there was, and George Washington said, by the way, I could not have won this war without the, without the uh, Hispanic help. Why? Because um, the British had blocked the, uh, the river access, and the only way that, that the George Washington and his troops could get ammunition was from the Spanish who were bringing it up under no flag. Uh, and so, so, so in the Revolution, in the Civil War, and every war, there was a greater ma and greater mass of, of military that were Hispanic. Uh, and in fact, today, 26% of all United States Marines are Hispanic. That's huge. One out of every four. More than one out of every four. And so that, that, that sense that we are always, that, that we are, are, we've just arrived. Is um, is just absolutely not true. So, so, so those are some of the main uh, um, aspects that are misunderstood, and mm -hmm. and I think the, the the question comes is that we see publication after publication in articles in books, in which all of a sudden they're discovering, oh, the first Latino to do this and the first Latino to that to do that, and yet so that creates an atmosphere of. Uh, Newcomers finally make it in, into uh, into the, the the American ideal, or, or how do how do you negotiate that? Because I think one of your points with this book, if I understood it correctly, is that you wanted not only U.S. Americans. I'm trying to make the difference, so because Americans were all Americans, but U.S. Americans 
but Latinos themselves don't know their own history in this country. So I think one of your points, surprising. one of your points, it seems to me in your book, is to create a, 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 an atmosphere in which you want to learn more, in which you just, it's not haphazard that you use words in Spanish, like a poor owl in New York that was called, el, what is it? Uh, el que? El flaco. The, why is it? Yeah. <laughs> it, it poor, all New Yorkers are crying about the poor owl. Anyway, so how do you, I think, I, am I correct in saying that that's one of your goals, if you will, with this book? It's like, open up your eyes, learn. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Because, um, yes, I mean, just look around. You look at, you, the, the, you talk about people saying the first Latino to do this, Lynn, and but but if you you if you look at the first Latinos, it goes way back. I mean, the first the first um, admiral of the United States Navy was a Latino, and he was he fought in the Civil War, and he was the one who said, uh, "Damn the torpedoes, um, full speed ahead." That was that was David. His name was actually Farragut. It was David Farragut. And you can see his statue in the middle of, you know, just steps from the White House, in the middle of, of Washington, D.C. And you can see his bust in the Army Navy Club in Washington, D.C. And nobody goes by and says, oh, you know, Hispanic hero. Um, uh, Stephen Vincent Benet, who was a writer, a very famous writer in the United States, his father was Esteban Benet. And he was uh, the person, he was the, he was the uh, head of all uh, ordnance, which means ammunition, from West Point. He was in West Point commanding all the ordnance that was used in the Civil War. And he was from St. Augustine, Florida. He was Spanish. Uh, he had some Caribbean blood as well, but he was a Latino. And the, the, what you say is so important because this is something, but Latinos don't know this even because it's not in the school books and it's not in the textbooks. This sort of information is, is legion. I mean, we, there's so much of it, um, but we're just not taught it. And we're not taught, we're not, it's not framed as, as um, you know, these incredible contributions that the population has made to American history. And this, you, you say in, in um, you mentioned at one point in your book, at the, I think at the beginning of your book, if I can find my notes, that's also another problem. Uh, <laughs> They're there. Yeah. I, I mean, being in book clubs gives you the, the ability to find notes and, and to quote pages. But you were talking about that Latinos are not a unity, but, but the life in the United States had kind of forced us into believe so, into look at, at, at a unity. And... Uh, one of the series I did for NPR had to do with four major cities that had completely la different Latino populations. So let's talk a little about that. It was New York, uh, LA, uh, San Antonio, and Miami. Those are four major cities with enormous Latino presence and power, mm -hmm. yet it's not the, the, and, the, the, and very the, different histories, too. Yes. Very different yes. histories. I mean, for the, the Mexicans who make up um, 37 million of the 64 million, uh, so they're the predominant uh, Mexicans. And at one time, that 2 million that I, met, I mentioned at the beginning, when I uh, first came to the United States as an immigrant, um, the 2 million was largely Mexican, Mexican-Americans. And you have to remember that they were Mexican Americans because the United States invaded Mexico, the Spanish territory. Uh, what happened, of course, when James Polk said, take your stick and go out there and, and westward ho, and we're going to, you know, this is manifest destiny. This is where we were made to be coast to coast, so go get it. And what it was, we don't read this in the textbooks, but what it was was an invasion of Mexican land. It was an invasion of the Spanish colonial territory at the time. Uh, um, the, the, well, the revolution had just been, had been fought and won, but it was the, this was Mexican land. 
And um, so the, the, the great pioneer movement, and we all see it as this wonderful you know, pioneer movement, was actually an invasion of, of, of uh, foreign land and foreign territory. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was uh, surprised and appalled at the way that it was being managed. He had always thought that we, that the United States would own South America, but not in that way. I mean, he, he uh, envisioned buying it as opposed to, to invading it. But so that was how the Mexicans came to be. Um, and when they say the border crossed us, we didn't cross the border, it, that's why. Um, the, uh, and that's how the Mexicans became Americans. When they became Americans, by the way, I should say that Mexico, knowing that it was leaving these uh, Mexicans behind because they didn't want to leave their land, uh, they had been there for generations, for hundreds of years, um, they had come in 1601, and this was now 1848, and they had had generations of, of, of people on the land they didn't want to leave. And, the, and Mexico said the, to the United States, all right, you uh, must make Mexicans white so that they can vote. Because in this country, if you were black, you could not vote. And they wanted to make sure that, you could, that their, the Mexicans they left behind could vote. So Mexicans became white, and so they weren't counted because they were, you know, they were, we never, we don't know really how many Mexican, Mexicans uh, then became uh, part of the citizenry because, you know, they weren't, they weren't necessarily counted, they were counted as white, uh, and they still do. And um, then, of course, as history moved on, uh, and the, uh, the, 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 um, the Spanish-American War was fought, um, the, United States occupied Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico then became an American territory. They were not given citizens' rights. You cannot vote for a president if you're Puerto, uh, Puerto Rican, or, and you cannot, um, you, you cannot, um, uh, you could serve in the military, certainly. Uh, and they do in great numbers. The Puerto Rican battalions have been amazing, extraordinary. But, um, but they can't vote and they can't have constitutional rights. Right. So, um, and then of course, uh, they, uh, uh, there was the occupation of Cuba, which, they, which the United States decided to leave behind because they were already had so much influence in Cuba that they didn't need to own it at that point. So, yeah, and this is where the, the, the tremendous influence um, of the United States on the, the eventually the Batista, um, uh, government, which was uh, the the very thing, the very corrupt system that uh, Fidel Castro fought against, um, and then of course there was the wave of Cubans who came up after the revolution. So you've had the the Puerto Ricanos going and the and the Dominicanos going to New York. You had the Cubans going to flooding into Florida. And so. Um, furiously that uh, they were sending their children, they, I don't know, I mean, people really know enough about the Pedro Panes who were um, sent over as children, children as young as four years old, sent by themselves, put on planes, sent uh, 14,000 of them. Um, some of them didn't see their parents again for four to five years. Uh, uh, quite a few uh, did not see their, their parents for 35 years. They were bandied around the country in different places. Um, and remarkably, uh, some of them have become incredibly successful. Right. Uh, uh, the uh, one that I interview for the book became the uh, CEO of AT&T. Um, so you have, you have these, uh, these waves of people coming in. It started really with the Mexicans invasion of Mexico, but then uh, with, the, um, with the occupation of Puerto Rico, with the really domination of Cuba, and, uh, and the Dominican Republic. Right. So you have you know, these pockets around the country. When you come, I mean, I'm Peruvian, you're Venezuelan, uh, when you come, you think of yourself of it, uh, as a Venezolana or a Peruana. Um, you don't think of yourself as anything bigger than that. Uh, and then you come to this country and there's this community of Latin Americans that you suddenly uh, are considered a part of. Um, and it, it, really interestingly, people 
accept the label. And um, if you are lat Latino, Latina, you, will, you find that um, you are socializing across you know, the countries that it in fact uh, may have gone to war against one, one another at one time. Um, so so it's, it's, it's really interesting how uh, these pockets of, of uh, you know, very separate identities, very diverse groups, so there is very little uh, in common really except for the feeling of Latinidad between a Cuban and a Mexican. Right, or between a Dominican and a Cuban. Um, you know, the, but the, well, a, yeah. the, you, you remind me of a quote in your book in which you said, when you talk about your, your own trajectory, uh, the, your parents uh, bifurcated, uh, 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 you were the bifurcated child of your parents, and we became destined to shuttle between two irreconcilable word, worlds and that you love beyond, beyond expression, and that taken separately could never truly be called home. Yeah. And that was very telling because it's a very important aspect of, of immigration. Yes. Is that you belong to, the, to your new country, you, but there is this double standard that you are superimposed on. Yes. And how do you negotiate that? Because I want to get to the point in which we can talk about the consequences of not being aware of this history. I mean, if we talk about Farragut and we, we, it's one person, oh great, we had one person in the army, but it's not one person, it's a whole, uh, it's a whole generation of people yes. who have built the history, uh, our history, right. American history. Right. So, uh, so how, do, how do you negotiate that? bifurcation and well, where really do you feel it's when you get home yeah. what's home yeah what's home what it, it, it's really interesting because um you know this country is made of many many uh Im waves of uh, immigration uh and the uh it, there is in a part of this you cannot avoid it is the question of race and ethnicity you know we are um the Latinos are a mixed race. We have been for over 500 years. Um, it was an extraordinary experiment, when you think of it, to um, mix races as promiscuously as Spain did with um, the indigenous and then eventually with the black population that was bought, brought in. People don't realize that um, in the 12 million people, Africans who were enslaved and shoved onto ships and kidnapped and brought to the Americas, of the 12 million, 1 million died en route. 11 million actually made it to the Americas. 350,000 came to the United States. All the rest, 10 million plus, went to Latin America. We have a huge population of, of um, African uh, Latinos, and, um, and most of us have some African blood. I do. Um, I have African blood, I have Asian blood from the Asian immigration that came into in, in Peru, especially uh, a lot of Japanese, a lot of, of Chinese. Uh, we are the most mixed race and have been for hundreds of years group in, on the planet. So um, when you think of that, we come to this country as already mixed. Right. Um, so it's a very, it's a sort of an interesting immigration because we can, we're like, we're like uh, chameleons. We can go into any, you know, the, the Dominicans and the Puerto Ricans, they live with uh, in the black communities and are very comfortable. Um, the uh, the Cubans slip into whiteness uh, in the United States. The Mexicans who were called white but treated as second class citizens and 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 called brown and and treated uh, very differently from the white label that they were actually officially given. Um, so when you have this sort of immigration in which we are already products of immigration and very strong uh, uh, strongly so. Um, it's, a, it's a very different thing than coming from 
Sweden, you know, and being Swedish immigrants, or coming from Ireland and being Irish immigrants. We already have, are the products of immigration in a very different way than those groups. Right. Well, it's not to say that there's no racism in Latin America. Oh, it, absolutely. I mean, racism is racism, but it's a different tinge of it. I mean, it's it was a, law. It was law by the, by the Spanish colonial system. You know, you, they had grids. And you can see this. Look it up. Um, they had grids in which, you know, the, the, the different race mixing and what they, the names that, that they would have for them, um, so what was one was called salto para atrás. You know, you're, if you if a, if a, a, an Asian married a black, you were a salto para atrás, which is a um, step backwards. Right, step backwards. <laughs> um, it, they 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 were very uh, very racist, and right. you, and and but <laughs> this this uh, is really uh, it shouldn't be amusing. It's 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 pretty terrible. But uh, in the Spanish colonial system, you could buy whiteness. You could go to the church and say, I have all this money, I'm not the right color, but I have all this money, so I'm going to buy what they called a cédula de uh, gracias. Uh, a cédula de gracias meant that you, could, you, you paid the money to the church and then you could be legally white, so then you could work, have certain jobs, teach. Um, so, you know, it was a very fluid uh, it, and, and very racist system that this, that Spain built. Right. I wanted to read another quote that you mentioned by by the writer uh, Reina Grande, the Mexican American writer, which is it's in your chapter called "Devil's Highway." I thought I was done with borders. I didn't know there would be more to be crossed: cultural borders, language borders, legal borders gender and career borders, which is very telling because it's a never-ending quest. Right, it's a never-ending crossing. Yes. Uh, Reina Grande actually walked across the border when she was six or seven years old with her father. Um, and she feels, she, she writes, she's, a, she's a, a very interesting writer, I recommend her. Uh, uh, she feels she's never stopped crossing borders. It's, it's constant um, and uh, very, very present uh, being a Mexican in California. Well, I mean, sometimes there's borders in a city, a neighborhood yeah. borders, uh, you, you know certain streets. A lot of African Americans, they know exactly what side of one main street they can go on without any trouble or what side they right. might get into trouble. So it's the borders are a, a constant presence. So how, what are some of the consequences, both about, about US Americans uh, and even Latinos, of not knowing enough about this history and this presence? Because that presence and that is also a source of power. Yeah. So what are the consequences of, of being ignorant or, or not knowledgeable, let's not be nasty, not knowledgeable enough about the, the, the history of the country we're in? It's, it's a very good question. I've just actually finished writing an article for the New York Times, which is coming out within the next week. Um, what is the result of that? Not, not knowing, not being in the textbooks, not being aware of, of our history and, 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 and having that shut out, and having it shut out not, not only from the whole population, but from us, um, is uh, erasure. It's invisibility. Uh, it is the fact that uh, that, that sense that we're, we're, we've just gotten here, you know. Uh, and it's that invisibility, I think, that, uh, that keeps boardrooms from not having Latinos, where the Latinos have something like 1% of the boardrooms of this country. 1% is, although, you know, we are now 20% of the country. Uh, and by 2060, we're going to be 30%. People will have Latino heritage. 1% in the boardrooms, which is extraordinary, really. That's what happens when you don't uh, when when you don't know your own population, and, and the U.S. doesn't, and even we, the Latinos, don't. Two two things. I inevitably get asked what's best to say: uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx. Uh, Chicano, uh, Tejano, 
New Riqueño, and so on and so forth. What, what works yeah. best? Well, this is my, my introduction is on the very fact that we, 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 all, we really don't have a name. We've been shuffled around with different names. You know, the, the, we, we were called Latinos, um, and Latin, whole Latin America was called uh, Latin America by all of all people, Napoleon, because he had designs on taking over when, when uh, Napoleon invaded Spain and conquered Spain for the time that he did. Um, he had these illusions that all those colonies that Spain had in the Americas were now going to be his, and to persuade the people that they were already related to Napoleon and the French, um, he called uh, us in Latin America Latinos, Latin. We're Latin, just like us, French. Um, so that was imposed. And then come the 70s uh, with Richard Nixon, he decided that he wanted to create a, um, an electorate out of the people that he knew so well. He was from California. His father was a grocer. Um, his uh, father, and he as a boy, would work with the agricultural workers because that was where the produce came from for the, the, sh the grocery shops that his father was, was um, uh, actually uh, Selling. sending the, 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 the fruit and the vegetables to. So he knew the Mexican population, the agricultural workers, and he, he wanted to make an electorate of them and have, and, and have them represented. I mean, he actually wanted them represented and wanted their support. Um, and so he called them Hispanics. That's where Hispanics came from, was from Richard Dixon. Uh, and he established Hispanic Heritage Day. Uh, and it was, we don't Nixon. realize that it was Nixon who did that. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, what happened was that the media took up Latinos as the word that they were going to use. And so Latinos is actually dominant now, although Hispanics is very much a part of, of us because there's the Hispanic Heritage Foundation, there is the League of Hispanics, I mean, there, there are many great institutions that uh, call themselves Hispanic. And then, of course, there was the, the, the academic circle, the intelligentsia in the universities that said, well, wait a minute, we want to be inclusive and we want gender equity, so we should use the term Latinx, a term that has never been taken up really en masse by Latinos. I think it's only 2% of people who call themselves um, or consider themselves Hispanic Latino call themselves Latinx. So, um, yeah, it so is, and now, you, and now there's you Latin say it in Spanish? Yo soy Latinexo? <laughs> Latinex? <laughs> um, yeah, it's awkward. Um, <laughs> so, so um, I have friends, Juno Diaz, for instance, who is a friend, a wonderful writer, calls himself Latine, because it's, it's neutral. And um, there are certain people who are taking up Latine, so we really are People with no name, and we don't, can't decide who we are. I'm getting signals that we should go towards the, the next question, but uh, or the next to the last questions before we open it for your questions. But uh, let's go back to your article, uh, last week's article in uh, or in the Washington Post, in which you talk about the, the assumptions about Latino. Um, being Republican or or or, uh, or not or, or Democrat, but the 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 mistakes that can create in this effervescent political period of assuming that all Latinos, this mass that we have been put in under, tend to vote the same way. Because I think it's a, a very important article, especially at this time. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, you, you know, the, um, the assumption has always been that we must be liberals, uh, we must be Democrats, because we like big government, which isn't necessarily true, but we like big government because it gives us money and it supports us because we're largely poor. That is um, such a misunderstanding of the population because it, 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 I, I hope you will look for my article in the New York Times, 
um, because the, the, the Latino population is actually an incredible economic force, uh, a huge economic force. And um, uh, the, so the, the Democrats have assumed, well, you, you, you need help, you need uh, welfare, which isn't true. Actually, even the undocumented Latinos have zero net effect on the U.S. government budget. I cannot say that about the, th this massive group that has been coming in in the last six months. But until then, there has, uh, uh, the U.S. Census has said very clearly that there, the effect on the, the government budget has been zero, net, net zero. So um, the assumption that we are looking for handouts isn't, isn't true, right. isn't necessarily at all true. So the Republic, also we are a population that doesn't vote enough. I mean, there are, uh, there are whole communities in Texas or New Mexico or Arizona that are largely Latino and they don't go to the polls. 17% since some communities in Texas go to the polls. And so the Republicans very smartly have seen a hole for recruitment. Not only that, but there is this uh, concurrent phenomenon of Latinos becoming evangelicals, uh, leaving the Catholic Church to become evangelicals. Uh, Guatemala is now um, majority Protestant evangelical, which is extraordinary when you think about it. A whole Catholic country has, pretty much, has gone majority. Brazil right now is one out of three um, of the people who go to church in Brazil are evangelical. In this country, more and more. And of course, as we know, the evangelical church very openly encourages um, a you to express yourself at the polls. And so, uh, and so the um, evangelicals tend to be Republicans, and so definitely on the right side. And so that recruitment is, is, has been very successful recently. So you can't count on, on one side or the other. We are not, I, I think Latinos are not binary. We don't think, in, we don't think blue, red. We don't think um, you know, left, right. Um, left, right means something different when you come from Latin America. Uh, absolutely different. Um, it's a different difference between a dictatorship and a revolution. You know, it's not there's it's not subtle. Uh, and so the uh, the affiliations are are very fluid. Um, in my own family, uh, my father and mother were Republicans. All the children have become independents um, and have voted differently in different elections. I certainly have. Um, and I think I'm, I'm more typical than, uh, as a Latino than, than most. Um, the liberals have had, you know, in the past, because of the New Deal uh, was important, I think, to Latinos. Um, that whole business of, of, of the New Deal was important. But it's changing, uh, and you cannot count on, uh, on, you know, that swing vote that we talk about all the time. I think your mother voted for Barack Obama, though, right? My mother voted for Bar Barack Obama, uh, yes, yes. I have no, no opinion on my part. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do I have time for one more question? Okay. Uh, you've been, uh, uh, you, I think your idea would be to start incorporating Latino history in the school books, in the, in the schools, or in every aspect of possible. At a time in which African-American history is being erased in many states oh, yes. out of our educational system. How do you envision bringing Latino culture into the curriculum or into our knowledge of American history uh, if, if, in this kind of climate? It's difficult, but it, you know you can't ignore history. I mean, it is there. It is there. Uh, I think that the, those who would uh, erase the critical theory um, studies, that sort of thing, uh, which is very, very political. Uh, uh, Latino history is not political. It, it's not, there, there's not, um, there's nothing, it's there. It's, it, it is part of the American story. That is really what I'm trying to get across. 
Um, slavery also is part of the American story, and we need to look it squarely in the face. And uh, it has been in, I extraordinary to me in my lifetime, because I remember coming to this country where I didn't know what color I was, and I was looking at signs that said colored uh, whites only, and I didn't know where to go. I was six years old the first time I saw that. Um, so that in my own lifetime, I have seen the sea change uh, of, of uh, sort of American identity. Um, and it, it has been a very welcome change. Um, I really uh, am very preoccupied about the, the um, move to censor or erase history. There is, you cannot do it. It's an impossible task. And what will happen is, uh, it could be um, catastrophic if you ignore history. I mean, it comes back to slap you in the face. Thank so, you, thank I'm you so very much to be, to for, be. for, uh, for being with us, for writing this book. Thank you. Uh, and for the, your um, calling to, uh, to the discussion the fact that we need to know more about American history in all its facets. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if either of you would feel sufficiently familiar with th this issue that has arisen in my head, and that is I myself am not Latino, but when I think of the sensibility of people from these varying, and they're very varied countries from Mexico down to the bottom tip of South America, Tierra all, Fuego, yeah. all attached in their sensibility to the Spanish heritage I'm asking myself, how do the Spanish people in Spain accommodate or navigate or handle their, and to what extent I'm not even sure, that they feel separate from Europe, and also the issue of the fact that Spain was under Islamic control for several centuries. How does that tension play out in, in Spanish sensibility, if you know? It's just a fascinating question. In Latin question. America or Spanish from Spain? No, Spanish from Spain. But I mean, okay. even if you're, if yeah. you're several generations down in South America and purely Spanish, you still have those issues because Spain went through so much. I mean, yeah, countries I think, I think change a lot. Right. It's just very fascinating. Well, Elizabeth, I'm sure you, you can answer that question too. No, no, but the you're way, the guest here. The way, the way that I would, would answer it is, you know, that um, there are still quite a few people in throughout Latin America in the very elite whites of, of Latin America who consider themselves, cri uh, criollo in, in Spanish, means that you are pure-blooded Spanish living in the Americas. And there are plenty of people who, are, uh, who, who consider themselves criollos in, in uh, Latin America right now, that, that fealty to Spain and that respect for Spain still exists to some extent. Certainly, um, my grandmother thought that she was pure-blooded criolla, um, and it turns out she was not. I mean, obviously, clearly, in my DNA, she was not. Um, but uh, how does Spain feel about it? How, the sensibility in Spain? I think Spain itself, as you say so correctly, um, was a mixed bag. You know, is a, a Moorish uh, dominance in that southern part of Spain for seven centuries, almost eight centuries. Um, you know, there was a there was a reason Ferdinand and Isabella wanted to purge uh, uh, the Arabs from the Spanish territory because it wasn't because they were so strong uh, and they had uh, they had already 
uh, Spain had already a good dose of, of Arab blood by then. And we can see it in, this, in, in um, the, the Arabs of Spain. The, in, you can see it in, in um, Sevilla. You can see it uh, throughout the, the southern part of Spain. Um, and also the Jewish population, which was so strong and needed to be expelled by Isabella and, and Ferdinand and, wa and was. Um, so many Jews, we don't know how many because they stopped counting themselves um, because of the Inquisition went to, to Latin America. Uh, people are discovering their, their, their Jewish blood. Um, so, you know, the Sephardic Jews, the, the Moorish, the, uh, Spain was a mixed bag and there are many, you see writings of the French um, and the English, particularly, who were, who were so anti-Spanish, that whole black legend thing, said, you know, the, uh, Africa starts in the Pyrenees because that's the Spain is so uh, mixed blood. Um, how Spain feels about it? I can't answer that question. <laughs> I know that that Spain, were at some point during Franco, was very welcoming to Latin American dictators that had to leave their country. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, I think I'm the Spaniard in the room, so I will speak as please as for my country. And what really has happened in uh, in Spain is that through literature, Latin America has conquered Spain. Because when in the you know the boom the literary boom with Garcia Marquez Vargas Llosa and Cortázar when they come to Europe and particularly in Spain and in Barcelona, they become in really the, the word of the the new literature and and what sells best and the best sellers. So the the feeling in academia and in the the literary Spain has been very welcoming and very, uh, I mean, if you don't know Latin American literature, then you're not, you know, into the, the, the politics or the culture of, of Spain. And uh, so that is a way how Latin America has become so much, you know, they are the, the new people that came in and, and took over, really, in Spanish culture. And now I want to address the comment of that, uh, that Africa starts in the Pyrenees because I just went to Morocco recently and you do not say that yeah. <laughs> because what happens is that Africa begins in the Sub-Sahara uh -huh. and, uh, and I found myself as a Spaniard in Morocco that no, that not in the Pyrenees at all. No. So, I mean, I could go on. I'm just but quoting. I'm just quoting. That, yeah. is, not my, that is not my well, view. There's no. also, that's a novelist and writer, Concha Alborg. One of the other uh, benefits of this trans, uh, uh, cultural is that the language, the Spanish language in Spain has been enriched by the Latin yes. American use of language and use of native language that are incorporated into the Latin American Spanish. Yes. So that there is a, an incredible richness that- uh, Absolutely, but you, you absolutely, absolutely. What you say is so right, the welcoming uh, of, of Spain, not only of the literature, but of the writers themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, there are so many Latin American writers, uh, the, the, the strongest writers right now are all living in Spain. Mm -hmm. So obviously, it, it's, a, it's a great um, uh, perch with, by which to see mm -hmm. uh, Latin America. Yeah, the last thing I would say is that Spaniards in this country are other. <laughs> I cannot check uh, Latino, I cannot check white Caucasian, I don't know what color they think we are, but, uh, but I have to check other when yeah. legally that's, that's what Spaniards in this country are. So, but that's another story. Interesting. That's interesting because, you know, I think there, there are those who would, wanna, who would want to include you as the Latinos. That's even yeah. when at, at some point Puerto Ricans had to say, even the most, um, uh, you know, with more uh, uh, African blood and all that would have to register themselves as white. Because yes. they were Puerto yes. Rican. A, a lot of them consider uh, consider themselves right. white. They don't re they don't discover that they are 
black really until somebody calls them that okay. in, in the United States. I, I wanted to ask you if you consider Latino Land a sister book to uh, Wilkerson's cast. To? Cast. Isabel, Isabel Wilkerson's book. I'm cast. sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. Do you know um, the book called Cast? Oh, yes, of course, yes. yes. Uh, Isabel Wilkerson, yes. 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 It's a it, wonderful book. Yes, it's a wonderful book, and a, as is yours, I, I mean, they feel like sister books in a way. That is the greatest compliment, really the greatest compliment, because Cast is an extraordinary book, and um, I would be very honored to be compared to it. Well, tell us, a, tell us a little bit about Cast. Cast is the story um, of not only of, of blacks in America, but of the whole concept of uh, racism. And um, she so captures that uh, sort of global sense of racism, and, and not only in this country, but she keeps bouncing the ball elsewhere so that we can see more clearly what we have here. Um, and it's, 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 it's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful book. Um, I would be very, very glad if it were considered, my book were considered a sister. Going back to Guatemala the last two years, having been away for 25 and living in small villages and been amazed at uh, the number of evangelical Christians, uh, uh, what caused the, the, sep the, the separation? The separation. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think it was uh, liberation theology, is my view. Liberation theology, which in which uh, the priests and the church uh, got churches around Latin America and got very involved in revolutions and in in insurrections, and oh, uh, a lot of people were killed, massacred, killed um, uh, on both sides of the the, the dictatorships and the, and the revolutionaries. And uh, I think there was a certain weariness, a weariness that set in. Um, and uh, the, the evangelicals and the Mormons, by the way, who were really very aggressively recruiting in Latin America, I have seen them. I've gone up 18,000 feet into the Andes to do, um, to do work up there and to uh, interview uh, people up there. And um, you will see in a stone hut, walking on the mud of the underneath a glacier drip, you will see a sign that says um, uh, uh, Kingdom of God Congregation, welcome. Uh, and, and the evangelicals and the, 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 the Protestant missionaries go and live with the people. They live with the people, they wash their clothes in the river along with everybody else. And there is something, and, and not only that, the fact that, you know, there, there, there is such a, a sort of, uh, they're part of the lives, but also what they promise. And what, uh, it's, it's really quite a beautiful promise because it's, it, you know, in, in the Catholic Church, we are taught uh, the poor will inherit the earth. You just have to die first, right? And once you die, you'll, you'll go through that. Uh, you'll, you'll go through that transformation and you will be rich in heaven. Uh, the evangelicals, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, what they call, um, uh, what is it that they call it? Yeah, economic um, oh, yeah. theology. Uh, right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes. And uh, the, the, you can have the riches on earth. Just join us, work hard, uh, be good, don't drink, you know, don't uh, show up at, at your job, be clean. Um, and that has, very, has been very persuasive. Yeah, uh, the, um, the ambition of Latinos, the work ethic of Latinos, it's, it's a, it's a not more natural fit than you might think. May, may I add one more thing? Maybe you don't agree with me, but there's also the unholy alliance between the Catholic Church and the dictatorships. Oh, you know, so you know that... With the conquistadores. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that it said that that a lot of the native peoples or the people who are now recruited for evangelicals are people who had seen the Catholic Church as allies, right, or, or as in, collu in, in collusion, yeah, in yeah. collusion with 
the dictators right. who were murderers and, and made prisoners. So that, that added to the economic uh, uh, heaven Mm -hmm. uh, it creates a pretty uh, volatile atmosphere. Abs absolutely, absolutely. Right. It's a yes, mm -hmm. very complicated story. Right. I think I think um, we have arrived at the end of our Q and A, okay. and we want to thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, thank you, thank you Elizabeth. <laughs>